Good morning. Good morning. You may begin when you're ready. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good luck. Thank you. Last year, on one of my impulsive days of spring break, I decided to give myself some things. I walked into the bathroom, picked up a pair of scissors, and I gave myself a very unfortunate haircut. And I deeply regret it, but fortunately, it's just hair and it grows back. But my haircutting was a symbol of embarrassment for a very long time for me. But for others, it's been a symbol of empowerment particularly for those who have gone viral on the internet for cutting their hair in, uh, for cutting their hair to support the protesters in Iran who are protesting the death of Masa Amini, an Iranian young woman who was killed by morality police in the nation for supposedly violating the headscarf rules. And unfortunately, Western governments haven't truly been reacting to this crackdown on protesters which according to the Associated Press in 22, has actually resulted in about 450 deaths and 18,000 protesters being detained by the Iranian government. And so when we come to the question of how the international government should actually respond and push back against the Iranian government's crackdown on protesters in the nation, it is critical that we focus on going beyond simple statements of condemnation. And then we ensure that there's an actual action plan and that supports these protesters and that shows them that Western governments actually care about what they have to say. And so we'll look at their action plan in three different ways. First, it's imperative that the international community increases its coverage of the Iranian protesters and amplifies citizen voices to ensure that their message is globally heard. Second, there must be an easing of technological sanctions to ensure that there's faster and quicker internet access throughout Iran and ensure that those who do take videos of protests and take videos of maybe further incidents similar to that of Masa Amini can actually have their message be seen throughout the globe and that the world knows about what's going on in Iran. And finally, it's critical that when Western governments place sanctions on Iran, that they are targeting the pockets of those who are harming and cracking down on protesters and ensuring that a double whammy of a crippling of Iranian economy and a crackdown from the government isn't happening to these protesters. So first, let's look at the fact that increasing the coverage of the Iranian protests by the international community is critical to ensuring that citizen voices are being amplified. Because according to the BBC in 2022, the Iranian government has instituted a policy that ensures that foreign journalists are not allowed to cover in any way, in video or in written form, the protests that are going on in Iran. Thankfully, several journalists are attempting to defy these rules, but they are being jailed and um, stifled by the Iranian government. But citizen journalists have been slightly luckier. And so it's critical that by increasing coverage, particularly of these journal citizen journalists and amplifying their voices through large international media organizations, that the Iranian government's um, crackdown on protesters is being seen globally and that the international community has a clear uh, has a clear vision of what they're fighting against and what they're trying to push back against. But simply amplifying the voices of citizen journalists through much more legitimate and well-resourced organizations is not enough. It is critical that we give these citizen journalists a direct platform to the rest of the world. And that leads me to my second point, which is that it's critical that Western governments ease their sanctions, particularly considering the tech industry in Iran, to ensure that these citizen journalists are able to get their videos and messages out to the world at a much faster pace before censorship can catch up to them. And this is this has been critically shown by Time 22, who are which has an article that argues that by easing some sanctions on um, Western-based companies such as Twitter, uh, Meta, which was formerly known as Facebook, and Google, 
Western governments can play an active role in amplifying these citizen journalists and ensuring that they don't have to wait for larger organizations such as the BBC and the CNN to pick up their videos and stories. It is critical that we make sure that these journalists can get to the rest of the world at a faster rate, because otherwise their voices will be and have been stifled by censorship authorities in Iran. We must ensure that their message can get out before that happens. But it is also critical that we are not only focusing on simply ensuring that the message of Iranian protesters is getting to the rest of the globe. We must also make sure that we are actively responding to what's going on and showing the Iranian government that the international community does not support or will not turn a blind eye to what is going on. And that leads me to my final point, which is about the fact that um, sanctions that target the finances of the Iranian government and hardline officials must ensure that it's doing exactly that, freezing their assets and not that of critical industries, which will affect the rest of protesters. And thankfully, some Western governments have already been very deliberate about that. Because according to Arson in 2022, the United States government was very effectively able to target and freeze the assets of morality police authorities and hardline figures in the Iranian government without broadly affecting the Iranian um, economy. And while it may be tempting for some of these um, Western governments and international organizations to broadly target the Iranian government. It is critical that they aren't hurting critical industries such as oil and agriculture, which not only um, fuel the economy of Iran as a whole, but also ensure that the protesters who are out on the streets are able to continue putting fo food on their tables and ensure that they won't be starving as they're trying to tell the world what's going on. And so it's critical that we are not punishing these protesters economically and ensuring that we are particularly and specifically targeting the, pro the authorities that are trying to stifle the protesters. So today, we've discussed the three main reasons why simply watching and sharing the videos of um, the viral videos of protesters being cracked down upon or women cutting their hair in solidarity with Masa Amini is not enough for the international community. They must be able to respond at a much stronger and quicker rate to the issues and the crackdowns going on. We have looked at first how legitimate or news organizations with many more resources than basic citizen journalists must not only defy Iran, the Iranian government's rule of no foreign journalist reporting, but also actively amplify the videos of citizen journalists to ensure their message goes out. But it's not simply enough to rely on these organizations who may not be able to pick up these messages faster than censorship authorities can shut them down. It's also critical that we are easing sanctions on tech giants that are in Western governments, particularly those such as Twitter, which are direct social media platforms that allow, allow these citizen journalists to directly disseminate information throughout the globe. And finally, when we do place sanctions on the Iranian government, it's critical that we are specifically targeting the figures that are harming these um, protesters and ensuring that we are not crippling the Iranian economy as a whole. If we want to actually help these protesters and ensure that Masa's Amini's death is not in vain, we must be able to support the protesters, amplify their voices, and ensure we're not harming their finances. Thank you. Thank you so much for judging. Thank you. Good luck today. Thank you. Good morning, Grace. Um, when you're ready, feel free to turn your camera on, unmute yourself. Um, if you want to test so I can hear you, feel free to do that as well. Um, can you hear me from back here? Go ahead and talk and let me see. Uh, can you hear me from back here? Yes, I can. All right. And then can you see me when I'm here? Yes, I can. All right. And then here. Sounds good. Yes, I can. So you go ahead and I'll start the timer with your first words. Thank you. Recently, soccer fans have been experiencing the thrill that comes every four years with the Soccer World Cup, the FIFA World Cup. They watch as their country, their team races and tries to get the ball in the goal. It's the first, the games have caused quite a bit of stir in recent times. 
that's the first time they're being held in the Middle East. And a lot of people have questioned this decision. Qatar has been a controversial country to hold the games. And many people are wondering, will hosting the World Cup cause Qatar to have a bigger stature in future politics? I would argue no, for three key reasons. Number one, because they're still only a small country. Number two, because the questions of human rights abuses. And number three, because we can look at history and see the evidence. As I said earlier, Qatar really is only a small country, even if they're pouring billions and billions of dollars into trying to make their country better and have more of an infra infrastructure. According to worlddatainfo.org, we can see that Qatar only has a 4,500-ish 4, 4, uh, square mile area. That's not a lot of land area for a country. It's about 20% less than the state of Connecticut. So not very much land mass for an entire country. What's more, they have roughly 3 million people in their country. For reference, New York City has 8.68 million people, which is an interesting comparison when you look at it. So although in New York, we see New York as the big, big city, Qatar is about a third of that, which is an important this realization to make. They can pour billions and billions of dollars and put all of this effort into trying to get their country to be popular and all that. But when it comes down to it, they're really only a small country. And on the general world stage, we don't see a lot and hear a lot from these smaller countries. We might hear a little bit from them, but from the small countries like Qatar, we don't hear a lot from them. I also want to talk about the human rights abuses that have been happening in Qatar recently. It's important that we look at them because a lot of people try and brush over it and ignore it. It makes the games less enjoyable when you realize that your stadium, the one you're sitting in, was built by having by the deaths of many migrant workers. Qatar, as I said earlier, has only a 3 million person population, or slightly less than that. 90% of that population is migrant workers, and only about 300,000 people in that population are actual Qatar citizens. That's an important realization to make there because if because if they are a lot of these people are migrant workers and sure migrant workers have a long history of poor working conditions, bad pay, but they need this job and they risk their lives, especially because the Qatar heat gets up to about 120 degrees in the summer, according to an NPR article from November of 2022. That's a really hot and bad working conditions are really hard to get or really hard to get through. It's hard to get through a day when you're you haven't had much water and it's 120 degrees and you're just trying to do physical hard labor and build a stadium. Not only that, as I, but as I said earlier, it makes the games less enjoyable to watch and you don't really want to think about it, but you have to because otherwise what legacy have that person left if not the entire stadium? I also want to talk to mention that the former president of the FIFA civilization or the FIFA organization was had been quoted in that NPR article saying that he regrets putting the games there and that it was built and sent there on the basis of corruption. They were never supposed to be held there. And he says it was, was a mistake which if it is a devastating thing to hear that thousands of about 6,500 migrant workers were killed since 2010 because they were building the stadium. And sure, you might hear other sources saying, yeah, no, it was way less, way less people died from building these. But that investigation was conducted by the article, the, sorry, The Guardian back in 2021 whereas Qatar is probably just trying to cover up 
all of the mistakes that have been made and all the migrant deaths that have been made. And if you look at the big, at the bias, it's probably more likely that the Guardian's unbiased than that the FIFA civil organization and Qatar country wants to cover up a lot of these deaths. Finally, I want to talk about how history is good evidence for us, and it's a good way for us to realize that the Qatar country of Qatar probably won't stay on the world stage very long. According, you know, the FIFA World Cup comes every four years, and you might recognize that sort of pattern from another organization, the Olympics, both the summer and the winter Olympics which also come every four years. And every four years, they go to a different country, meaning a different country has to prepare every four years. They have to build stadiums and build housing for the athletes and the visitors who are expected to come. And there's so much effort that has to be put into building both of these. And I would personally argue that FIFA World Cup and the Olympics are pretty similar organizations. With that being said, according to an Insider article from 2021, we could see photos of abandoned Olympic centers, abandoned Olympic stadiums. And you can look at that and realize that that same thing could happen to the Qatar stadiums. Countries have been certain trying to promise that they'll build things around these mall, these stadiums turning them into shopping malls and other useful things for the citizens to use daily. And then they never do. And it gets abandoned and covered in graffiti and all sorts of gross. And that same thing, again, could happen to the Qatar stadiums. Again, billions of dollars were poured into it, into building these stadiums and the housing and the highways for these people. And the country is trying to promise that they'll be able to use this. But with a population of only 3 million and a lot of these people not being able to get to these stadiums, it's unlikely that a lot of these stadiums will be able to be used because not enough people have interest in watching a soccer game every single weekend. So if they were to get their money's worth in this Qatar, these Qatar stadiums, it would be a long time until they do. Ultimately, we as a society have to make the realization that Qatar holding the games was a huge mistake and they won't even get a better stature on the global stage because of these games, because they're still only a small country. There are human rights questions and abuses that have been going on. And finally, because we can look at the evidence that history has provided to us. Ultimately, it is up to us to make the realization that Qatar holding these games was a big mistake. And while we can all wish for Qatar to do better and have a better life for its citizens because of these games, we have to realize that Qatar isn't going to have a better position within the world just because they held these games, which were given to them out of corruption. Thank you. All right. I'm going to log off. Thank you so much for judging. Have a good day. Thank you. Good morning, Kate. Um, when you're ready, go ahead and turn your camera on. <clears throat> you can feel free to test your microphone. All right. Um, can you see and hear me well? Yes, I can. Cool. Um, should I just start whenever? Should I start whenever? Yes, you may. I'll start the timer with your first word. Cool. Okay. I haven't gotten to see my family in three years. For some context, me, my mom, my dad, and my sister live here in the United States. But our extended family, including grandparents on both sides, cousins, nephews, aunts, uncles, great-grandparents, great-aunts, great, I could keep going. They all live in China and we haven't gone to see them in three years because of, obviously, COVID. I remember when lockdown started, early 2020, we all felt so hopeless. 
luckily, now I am fortunate to live in the United States where I am able to go to school in person and go to most of the places I need to go to without, without having to be on lockdown. However, the same cannot be said for my relatives and everyone living in China because of their current zero COVID policy. What this policy entails is that it is aimed to create zero COVID cases in China, meaning that they still have severe lockdowns, people are not able to go to school, people have lost their jobs and have not been able to get them back, and a lot of people are jobless and quarantining, still, after two years. I mean, I can't imagine. Online school for one and a half years was already hard enough. Imagine still having to be in online school. Anyways, because of this, there have been a lot of protests, specifically from workers who want their jobs back, who want their jobs back, or at least want to see their families who live five minutes away, but are unable to because they are stuck in lockdown. So, which leads to the question, will workers' protests in China lead to meaningful reforms and protections? To fully answer this question, we need to look at three sections. Number one, looking at what's happening in China right now more details of the protests and where they stem from. Number two, looking at examples of protesting in the past and how that's turned out. Before number three, finally, reaching a conclusion and answering our question. AP News on November 27th of 2022 states that one contributing factor to these protests is that workers aren't being paid enough. Now, since a lot of people have lost their jobs since the beginning of COVID, many have been desperate to seek jobs, no matter how hard they might be. So when there was an iPhone factory opening in China, many people were desperate to go in order to be able to work to support themselves and maybe their families. Now, they were promised 25,000 yuan, yuan being the form of currency in China, for two months of work. However, when they got there, they discovered that this had been a lie and they weren't getting the money that they were promised. Because of this, a lot of people walked out from the factory, refusing to work even after signing a contract, many even protesting and fighting against the police officers. Another reason for these protests is what CNBC on November 27, 2022 calls zero COVID protests, which stems from these workers not being able to work and their increased frustrations with the government for not being able to send their children to in-person school or even make enough money to support themselves. Because of this, a lot of people have taken to the streets, risking their lives and their freedom in order to demand change. Now, this stuff hasn't only this zero, COVID, this zero COVID policy hasn't only affected them, it has also affected the entire nation's economy. Because people aren't able to work, many people are in poverty, stock markets have crashed, and now China is having trouble trading with other people. And because, which leads to what CNN on November 28, 2022 calls rare, rare. Because protests in China in the first place are very rare because of how the government handles these protests with brutality. However, because of the enormity of the problem, many people have still protest anyways, risking themselves. Harvard Library cites Tiananmen Square, a protest that happened in China where many, many people were brutally suppressed and killed because of their beliefs. Even with something as scary as that, people have still resorted to protesting because of how serious this issue is to them. Which leads us to our question. Will these protests actually create change? NPR on November 15th of 2022 states that there certainly is enough intensity and hate from the people working in China for them to protest so much and demand a lot of change. That being said, New York Times on November 29th states that the final vote is still up to the government. Sure, they'll listen and tune in and make sure that they don't look bad by ignoring the protesters. But then again, the final word is still up to them. No matter how much people protest, nothing will change if the government decides to not do anything. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, should I leave? Yes, you, you can. Okay, thank you. Good luck. I Good luck with the rest of your day. All right, next um, we have Aaron. Aaron, when you are ready, go ahead and I see you now with your camera. If you want to test the microphone, I can hear you. 
So okay. I will um, begin the timer with your first words. Good luck. Um, as a question, did you want sure. to see my question in the chat? Um, yes, I do see that. Thank you. Okay. Time will begin on my first word then. And also okay. be timing myself. Okay. As entertainment becomes more valued over knowledge, many people are opting out of traditional news and instead turning to places like The Onion. Infamous for its political satire, The Onion provides headlines that are comedic, but ultimately false. For example, returning Jesus Christ, downed by the U.S. missile defense system, or truckers are immune to COVID because gas prices hurt much more. And as ludicrous as that last headline sounds, this is representative of the situation in Canada earlier this year, where there were widespread truckers' protests in the city of Ottawa, because what the Canadian government did was they forced truckers to take the vaccine, as they would be traveling between country to country, posing a threat to the spread of the virus. And so many truckers were gathered up in Ottawa to protest against this and unite against it. But as the protest grew, something different actually happened. Politico explains in an article on February 14th just this year that for the first time in Canadian history, just Prime Minister Justin Trudeau actually invoked the Emergencies Act to prevent the protests from further happening. And what the act essentially did was it caused the protests to just stop. And this is because law enforcement at the time were incapable of handling it. But many political pundits are now pondering whether or not Trudeau's use of the Emergencies Act was morally justified as it essentially suppressed a protest. And so considering that Canada is a democratic country and that the result of whether or not this is justified could easily impact the democracies of many other countries, it becomes imperative for us to ask, was Prime Minister Trudeau correct to invoke the Emergencies Act to address the truckers' convoy earlier this year? And the answer is yes, because the truckers' convoy posed a significant threat to the security of Canada. And we can see this primarily in three different ways. First, supply chain disruptions. Second, violent protests. And third, but perhaps most importantly, there was no alternative. So let's peel the onion of the truckers' convoy, starting with the fact that there is a huge supply chain disruption. The CNBC explains in an article on February 17th, just this year, that one of the primary reasons why the protests were so dangerous wasn't actually the direct violent consequences, but more so how it disrupted supply chains. Now, the trucker protests took place in Ottawa, but that was directly linked to the Ambassador Bridge, a bridge connecting Canada and the United States, which the article quantifies accounts for $360 million worth of trade every single day. But because of the trucker's convoy, they were no longer able to use this bridge to meaningfully trade with one another. And that's important because some of the goods that were being traded include auto parts and food. And if these goods aren't able to be transported, that causes inflation not only for Canada, but also for the United States and their citizens, posing a threat to food security. But another factor to take into consideration is the actual timeline of events. When the truckers' convoy broke out, we were currently in the midst of the beginning of the Russian-Ukraine war, as well as the pandemic. That meant inflation was already rampant, and if these truckers' convoy continued to contribute to that, neither Canada nor the United States could afford it, posing a threat to both of their citizens. But for authoritarian states, protests are much like cutting an onion. They make them want to cry. But Canada is a democracy. And so while they are embracing protests, they can only embrace them if they're peaceful. That was exactly the problem that happened with the truckers' convoy. The National Post explains in an article on November 25th that the truckers' convoy was far from any peaceful protest. Because what was happening is you had thousands of citizens in ramping up in one city, and you had vehicles that were being used in militarized actions, going to even hit police officers. But even on top of that, the protests crossed a line that should never be crossed, that being 
placing children at the front line of the protest to prevent law enforcement from taking any action, as if they would, they could potentially harm those children. But even then, and further investigations show that there were also weapons present at the protest. Now, many political pundits will bring up the point that there wasn't any deaths in the protest, and therefore it wasn't justified. However, what we've seen historically in not only Canada, but also countries such as the United States, is that when you have such large protests, these inevitably escalate and lead to the significant possibility of great violence, whether that be through the collective action of the protesters as a whole, or the much more dangerous and unpredictable action of an independent. So because the protests were ultimately out of control, and as it continued to grow and pose a greater risk to Canadian citizens, Trudeau was justified in invoking the Emergencies Act. But finally, let's go one layer deeper and realize that Trudeau simply had no other alternative than to invoke the Emergencies Act. That's because the BBC explains in an article on November 25th just this year that the Truckers Convoy was a three-week-long protest and while the initial first couple of days, Trudeau was told by law enforcement they would have the situation handled. But as time went on, the protests grew even bigger and bigger, showing that law enforcement simply had no control over the protests. For that reason, Trudeau felt compelled to use the Emergencies Act. In fact, he stated that if he felt that law enforcement could meaningfully control the citizens, he would have never used the Emergencies Act in the first place. The problem was that they simply couldn't. And as the protests continued to grow larger, escalation kept happening. That posed a significant threat to many citizens, especially innocent ones such as the ones living in Ottawa who didn't have anything to do with the protests. At the time, even the majority of Canadians were against the protests in the first place. And so, heeding the words of the majority of his citizens, Trudeau was forced to use the Emergencies Act as the only meaningful solution. And so... When returning to today's question, was Prime Minister Trudeau correct in using the Emergencies Act to address the truckers' convoy earlier this year? We see that the answer is a clear yes, because it threatened the security of Canadian citizens through three different ways. First, block critical supply chains. Second, violent protests. And third, there was no alternative. So while The Onion was a satirical news network, the problem at hand is far from any joke. And we can actually see that Prime Minister Trudeau took the most meaningful solution to ensuring peace and stability in Canada. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Have a good day. You do the same. Good luck today. Good morning, Amaya. Go ahead and turn your yep, turn your camera Good on. Good morning. Uh, I'm your fifth speaker, correct? Yes, you are. All right, perfect. And for transparency's sake, are you okay if I time myself and just place my phone like off? Sure. Like, of the screen? Yes, okay. that's fine. Um, and, and I will. Oh, sorry. Go I'll ahead. start the timer with your first words, but go ahead with your question. Um, I was just gonna ask if I would, uh, if I could receive like um a fist when I hit seven minutes. Sure. Okay. And do I get a 30 second grace? Yes, you do. All right. And would you like me to state my question? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Have Australian Chinese relations reached a turning point? Again, have Australian Chinese relationships reached a, or have Australian Chinese relations reached a turning point? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I will go ahead and begin my timer. When we tug on a single string in nature, we can often find that the world is an interconnected web that is affected by even the slightest changes. And this phenomenon can especially be applied to the world's global trade network. And when two countries seem to have a little bit more tension than usual, this entire network is thrown off. 
with the Washington Post reporting just two days ago that historically, China and Australia, two countries that are key when it comes to the global trade network due to their access to sea lanes and interregional trade as well, have had increased tensions resulting in the world supply chain being thrown off. And while historically these two, these two countries have been prosperous, result, uh, contributing to over 31% of the world's global trade, these increased tensions have resulted in both countries losing over $212 billion in both exports and imports. And all countries across the world have been heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and the supply chain disruptions have resulted, that have resulted from it. But with China's and Australia's tensions growing even more, major trade networks that go through the Australian Chinese sea lanes are no longer functioning like they used to. And in order for all of the world's citizens to be able to receive the goods and services they need necessary to survive, it's essential that we examine this transition in relationship bringing us to today's key question. Have Australian-Chinese relationships reached a turning point? And the answer is an unfortunate yes, due to escalation of tension between the two countries, seen through three key points. First, through Chinese perception of Australian foreign policy. Second, through Australian anti-CCP rhetoric. And third, through China's attempt to infiltrate the Australian military. Now, as I said earlier, COVID-19 had definitely thrown off the entirety of the world's global supply chain, but it's essential to examine that certain countries were affected sooner by the COVID-19 pandemic than others. More specifically, since the COVID-19 pandemic originated in China, according to a report by the CDC in September, of, in, in September of 2021, it's essential we examine that China was the first economy that was hindered by the COVID-19 pandemic. As the Washington Post reports just three days ago, that China's economy is still recovering from the fact that many major manufacturers responsible for global exports had to be shut down for months on end, this recovery has been slow and hindered by many factors, one of which being that China was the first to experience an economic shutdown. By contrast, the U.S. economy didn't, didn't experience a major shutdown until two months following China's shutdown, according to a report by NPR just three days ago. And because of Australia's geographical nature, being surrounded by bodies of water on all three ends, trade is essential for them in order to look out for the well-being of their citizens. And because essential goods previously being received from China were no longer were, were no longer being facilitated into Australia's trade networks, Australian citizens found themselves isolated. And the Australian foreign policy began to favor trade agreements within the United States. And during the beginning phases of the COVID-19 pandemic, Australia, Australian-American trade increased by a staggering 17%, while trade between Australia and China decreased by over 28% according to a report this time by the New York Times on February 13th of 2022. It's essential we examine the signals that this sent out to the Chinese government. China perceived Australia's foreign policy as one that began to favor the American government rather than the Chinese government. And because the US and China are major rivals, this contributed to major tensions between Australia and China even though Australia was simply doing what was necessary in order to have a steady stream of goods in, funneled into their nation. The second key reason why tension has increased between Australia and China is, between, is because of anti-CCP rhetoric in the Australian government. Now, Sue Lines is the senatorial leader of Senate in China, and she is one of the first governmental leaders to openly criticize the Communist Party of China. Now, this is extremely controversial, as, as I said earlier, there is historical precedent that precedent that China and the US, uh, China and Australia have had major connections through trade. So preserving a relationship and not criticizing one another is one of the essential components to keeping these trade connections going. But Sue Lai's decision to openly criticize CCP and call out Xi Jinping for allowing the genocide of Uyghur Muslims in China to ensue, despite displaying multiple UN rights violations, led to global turmoil 
Australian media companies began to cover China in a very volatile way, which obviously didn't bode well for Xi Jinping, who began to, again, who began to perpetuate media within his own country against the Australian government. And Vox News coins this media war just three days ago as the Australian-Chinese battle of oppression. He detailed, he, to elaborate, the author of this article details how Australia's government began to, to criticize China's government for their oppression of freedom of speech and Uyghur Muslims, whereas China's government began to criticize Australia for leaning more towards the US in terms of foreign policy. And again, this trickled down to to everyday citizens and tensions increasing between Australian citizens and Chinese citizens as a whole. And while this may not directly affect trade, The Economist reports just two days ago that one of the key facets to global trade networks working effectively is lack of tensions between two countries. And because social tensions between Australian and Chinese citizens have heavily increased, we can see that tensions between trade have increased as well. The third and final reason why Australian Chinese relations have reached a turning point is due to China's attempt to infiltrate the Australian military, with NPR reporting just three days ago that recent reports have have surfaced about Australian veterans being contacted by key Chinese government officials being offered to be paid millions of dollars in order to give up key information about Australians' military tactics and military initiatives. Following this happening, Sue Lines, who I mentioned earlier, gave many volatile remarks against the Chinese government and the CCP, contributing to tensions. So when returning to today's question and asking, have Australian Chinese relations reached a turning point? The answer is a clear yes due to increased tensions. And again, because the global supply chain is so interconnected, just like nature, it's essential that these tensions are resolved as soon as possible. All right. Um, could I get my time on that, please? Yes, I got seven minutes, 20 seconds. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. You do the same. Thank you. Good morning, Giovanna. Uh, you're the next contestant, and um, I can see you. If you want to talk, I can check that your microphone's working. Sorry. That's okay. I hear you. Um, I will start the timer when you're ready with your first words. Yes. Um, I'm a speaker. Is that correct? Right? Yes, it is. Okay. So I used to be in soccer. And I thought I was like really, really good. And like my parents put me in there and I like, I like secretly liked it. And I really thought I was gonna be the next like Messi or Charito, but like woman version. But um, that did not go as planned. I was not very successful with that. So my soccer career ended in like three months. And that is exactly what is happening with Iron Rand's Can's plan to be, to return to politics. So when asked the question, is Iran is Iran's can't plan to, re, to return to Pakistan's politics? The answer is no, for three key reasons. He has lost his trust. Him, one, because he has lost people's trust. Two, because he has lost before. And three, because the way he ran in office before. So so starting off with my first key issue and why his plan to return to politics won't be successful is because of how he treated people and how he lost people's respect. So reported reported by 
reported by The Guardian, reported earlier on, early August of this year, it was stated that he threatened police officer and a female judge. When you go on and do this and treat people like this, it just goes to show that you don't have the best character because of the way you treat others. So when you go on and do this, and people see this and hear about this, it goes to show that people will lose trust in you and lose faith in you because of how you treated other people and the way you don't, you, and the way it shows lack of respect for others. So another key issue and importance and why he won't, he, his plan to return to politics won't succeed, be successful is because of him losing before. So it was stated by BBC News reported earlier of November, November of this year. It was stated that he, he was rooting for this act, the No Confidence Act, and he was going all in for it and all that. And he lost. This just goes to show and prove that if you already had lost this, you just, these statistics go on and show how you don't have that many voters and people going for you and rooting for you because if you already lost once, the probability of you losing again because you have already not, because the probability, probability of you losing again is very high because you already lost once and you don't you didn't get these people's attention and support the likelihood of you losing is very high so for another key issue and importance on why why can't can't plan to return to politics won't be successful is because the way he ran he was in he was while he was in office so while he was in office, many things were very rocky, like my soccer career, like my soccer career that lasted for like three months. Yeah, that's how rocky things were um, with Khan because while he was in office, there was many issues and struggles. There was a payment crisis and many things started to rise, like prices. Um, prices started to rise with like oil prices, tariff prices and all that and people were not happy about this when people are not happy with you because of the way you ran previously on office it goes to show how how they're not going to be happy with you when you run again because they're going to be like oh okay so this is how he was before he'll probably be the same way because he probably didn't change and there's nothing new with him because he acted this way and he did, he did, it was like ended up lowering prices. He, he did end up changing, but that's only because people weren't happy and he was like, oh, okay, I need to backtrack to this. But he shouldn't, he should have already been at a better per se point in his political career. So tying everything all together, with with my soccer career, you know, lasting three months and thinking I was gonna make it pro and all that. Yeah, that didn't go as planned and that is not gonna go to plan with Khan when he tries to return to his political career because of the way he treated people and him like losing trust into others too because of him the way he was the way he was during office and two because and three because him already losing losing thank you um what was my turn it was uh six minutes and 52 seconds thank you thank you good luck today thank you